Welcome, everyone. I'm Farina Mir. I'm the director of the Center of South Asian Studies. Um, and it's my great pleasure today to welcome you to the Summer in South Asia Symposium. Um, many of you who are here know about this program because obviously you went on it. Many of you seem to be the families of those who have gone. And thank you for placing your trust in uh, the center and allowing your child to be intrepid and take up this fellowship opportunity. And I hope some of you who are here are also here to see what is possible with this fellowship. We are, um, I'm particularly touched this year to be celebrating our 10th year of this program. Um, and this year we sent 10 students to South Asia bringing our numbers actually over this 10 years to 74 fully funded students sent to India over the summer to do independent research or work with an NGO and um, to have a, a learning experience with real solid academic content as well as life experience enhancement. We have a number of people to thank that make this program possible, and it actually begins with our staff. Um, is Janelle Fossler in the room? Janelle is sitting right here, front and center. Please give her a round of applause, everyone. <laughs> Janelle has been absolutely amazing. This program is, um, you know, it, it is core to what we do at the center. Um, and it requires actually a lot of input to make sure that our students are going out to do something meaningful for them um, and also safe so that you both go away and come back to us safe, which is a, a real issue. So anyway, I just want to thank Janelle. I want to thank also Dan Cameron, who um, is just completed his master's at Eastern Michigan University who interned and worked with, with us on the program over the summer, um, and you make it possible. And of course, this program would not be possible without an anonymous donor who, uh, who, pr who provided to the University of Michigan and the Center for South Asian Studies a gift that um, we have in an endowment. So this is a program that is actually endowed in perpetuity, um, and it really is our role at the center is just to be um, stewards of this gift. And that anonymous donor is today um, still going to remain anonymous, but he's with us. Um, and I will only share his first name, and that is Dave. And before handing the floor over to Janelle and getting the student presentation started, I'm going to invite Dave to come and say a few words to us. Thanks for being here, Dave. Thank you, Farina, and as she said, I'm an anonymous donor, so <laughs> no one will know who I am. Um, it's exciting to be back on campus and see the energy and all the, you know, current students and this type of thing. It's, you know, uh, really great. Uh, I'm sure some of you have wondered why did I have this endowment, and there's a couple reasons. Uh, first of all, this university, I think, is a fantastic place. It's been very good to me and my family. My grandfather taught here. A number of my uncles, my brother, uh, my father-in-law, my father attended the university and graduated. Um, my youngest son was here, and uh, he's a passionate football fan of the team. And he has two young sons. Uh, one of them is uh, the class of 2033. The other is the class of 2035. And um, every football weekend, they watch the team. And fortunately, this year, uh, it's been quite successful. And the grandchildren, whenever a touchdown is scored, you know, touchdown! <laughs> And so it's my hope that this weekend they'll wear their little voices and arms out uh, by <laughs> shouting that. Um, so uh, I've had you know, great experiences here, my family has, and I wanted to give something back. And the question was, what can I do? Well, 
just before I retired for about a year and a half, I traveled to India a number of times on business. And I thought I was prepared before my first visit there. After all, I had had extensive international experience. I'd gone across the Detroit River to Windsor, Ontario, <laughs> any number of times. Um, also, because many people in India speak English, they obviously think like me. They perceive the world like me. And, uh, you know, what's the big deal? Well, this feeling didn't last beyond uh, my first few minutes in India. And it was sort of like Julie Gar Garland on when she first arrived in the Kingdom of Oz. Toto, we're not in Kansas anymore. Uh, I found India to be a land of contrast, as I'm sure you know, this year's fellows and past year's fellows and future fellows will find out. Um, the disparity of wealth, um, extremely successful wealthy people versus the masses of, that are living in abject poverty. Um, beautiful, stunning scenery, urban blight. Um, the latest in technology versus bullet carts. Um, you know, ancient culture versus Bollywood. You know, these were all things which I th thought were amazing. And I went there and I found India to be exciting, but also disturbing. I found India to be enjoyable, but frustrating. But above all, I found India to be eye-opening and mind-expanding. So consequently, when I had the opportunity to learn about and fund this program a decade ago, I jumped at the chance. And I also hope that in some small way, uh, my contribution and the students who go there as fellows will foster a greater understanding between the peoples in the United States and the peoples in India. And, you know, that's to be determined in the future when one of you becomes President of the United States and, <laughs> and somebody you associated with is the Prime Minister of India. But, I, 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 you know, that's sort of my goal, which I, I hope for. <laughs> um, this program has been going on for 10 years, and when I was considering funding it, the endowment, I had real qualms. First of all, would students be interested in doing this? Would their research projects be meaningful to them and to others? Um, would the Center of South Asia Studies staff and faculty be supportive, not just for a few years, not just for you know eight or ten, but ongoing. And uh, also, would the students be willing to step out of their comfort zone and participate in a program that, by design, is extremely challenging? Um, would the experience in India be life-changing or life-reaffirming? Um, you know, in other words, would the program be a success? And uh, I think every year um, it has been reaffirmed, yes, it has been a success. And I think, I, you know, I want to thank the faculty and staff of the center. I want to thank the students in past present and hopefully in the future for, you know, participating in this. And um, every year the um, students send thank you letters. And this is the most meaningful aspect of my life each year. And thank you for this. Uh, there, you know, this makes the minor donation of the funding for this worthwhile. Um, I'd also um, ask you 
as you know, I know you're tied up with um, your classes, your aspirations for your future life, getting a job, perhaps. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, as you go through life, if you think you have got a fantastic education here, and think, well, can I give something back? Um, I think no matter how big or how small that gift, uh, it would provide uh, some other student in the future to do something that would maybe be of uh, important impact to them. So think about that in the future. And once again, thanks to everybody involved in this. Thank you, Dave. Welcome, everyone. Hi, my name is Janelle Fossler, and I'm the Fellowships Coordinator for the Center for South Asian Studies. Um, it's been such an incredible privilege to work with this year's fellows. Um, all of them inspired me and taught me so much, and I'm just so proud of the amazing work that they did this summer. Um, I'd also like to thank Dave for making this transformative experience possible, not just for this year's fellows, but as previously mentioned, for um, over 70 students at the University of Michigan. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Farina Amir and Dr. Matthew Hall, who are both acting or were both directors of the center over this application cycle for their hard work on and just dedication to this program. And I'm also extraordinarily grateful to Dan Cameron, who is an intern, um, who has been an intern at our center since May uh, for all the hard work he's done. He's really left a lasting impact. And lastly, I'd just like to thank Ariana Paredes Vincent, who is not able to attend tonight, but she recently joined the center as a peer advisor, and she was a 2015 Summer in South Asia Fellow, and she worked very hard to make tonight a success. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Grace Beckman. Uh, Grace is a senior with a major in English and a minor in Community Action and Social Justice. Okay, well, I don't really have to give an introduction. That is my introduction. So um, I just want to say thank you so much um, to Dave and also to CISA program. Um, I know that, like, for me personally, I wouldn't have been able to do this without the generosity and the support um, beforehand and also while I was on my trip. So it's very meaningful, and I want to thank you very much for that. Um, so, let's see where we start here. Oh, no, you're fine. Okay, wonderful. Um, so, these are just um, some of the things, like a few, from like the very large list of things that, you know, I gained when I was over there. Um, you know, personally, I think, like something that really stuck with me was before I left, Janelle was like, if you ever wonder, um, if you're ever like uncomfortable or like feeling um, scared or something, just like wonder why you're feeling that way. And I think that that's something, you know, kind of that we could use always. So like, why is somebody having a different, um, like look on life than you and stuff? And so I think that that really helped me when I was over there. Um, so understanding patients, adaptability, um, research, writing, communication, you know, honestly, I would say I learned research. I didn't know anything about it before. Uh, you know, we're still learning, but it was wonderful. And I want to say thank you for letting me do that. Um, okay. So, oh, you know about me already. Okay, so I worked with Pratham, um, and Pratham is a really large NGO. It's in 21 out of 29 states, um, focusing on education access and reform. So specifically, um, I worked with their Second Chance program. So it's for students who dropped out for like various reasons, um, and now have the opportunity to come back and get their secondary education. Um, so it's focused mainly on women and girls, but like does also help men as well. Um, so it's like a 12-month program, and then at the end they take their 10th um, grade examination, which is different than here, obviously. Um, yeah, so it's focused from ages 16 to 25, um, some older, some younger. Um, this is a classroom. Um, some of the students in this top left one taught me how to say my name is Grace in Hindi. Um, it's meta name Grace. Hey, um, and they wrote it out. It was actually very, thank you, thank you. It was actually very sweet um, because they wrote it in English, but like how you would say it in English, you know, which I thought was like really impressive. I could never do that in a different language. So I was, I thought it was very impressive. 
Um, so my research, um, it was basically looking at like why um, students were dropping out and what motivated them to return, um, but then also looking at Pratham as a whole and how it was addressing those issues and how the students thought that Pratham was going. So I, um, it was like really awesome because my research, I basically just got to like talk with people and hear their stories, which is wonderful. Um, so I spoke with current students, passed out students, um, and then their family members, and as well as their teachers. Um, so I had a, a translator, and they helped me to speak with um, all of these people. And I basically asked, like, why did you drop out? Like, what were the factors in that? Um, what, like, made you want to return? Um, and then kind of like, what do you think is a societal view of women's education? Um, so it was like really impactful answers and really amazing to hear those. Um, okay, so these are some of like the main things um, that were like the reasons. So distance is a big one. Um, if the girls, like a lot of them walk to school, so if it wasn't in a safe area or their um, parents didn't feel comfortable, then they would have to like be forced to drop out. Um, finances is pretty like um, self-explanatory, but if their parents needed help, um, either they would have to go and get a job or they would um, maybe do the housework while both parents worked. Um, poor schooling, so um, a lot of like the government schools and stuff, the teachers don't get like one-on-one -on -one attention, and so that's what Pratham was able to do. Um, and so if they were getting ready to take these exams and they didn't feel confident in what they were going to do, um, they would just like drop out of school instead of um, like getting the help that they needed. Um, and so Pratham, Whereas in government schools, you had to pass seven out of the seven subjects. Pratham, you had to pass five out of the seven. So they also had that leeway there. Um, and then family conditions, if there was like poor health in the family or something, they would again have to help the family members. So, okay. Um, so my experience, um, culture shock, I had it. It was the thing. Um, one of my friends asked me actually if I had culture shock and I was like, yeah, you know, the first day I was there, I cried for five minutes in my bathroom and then I was like, but I can't leave, like, essentially, like, I can't really leave, you know, like, I have a plane ticket for July, and so here I am, so I just, like, stopped crying, and then I went out, and that was all, that's all that happened, um, <laughs> which is kind of, like, a sad way to deal with it, but that's what happened. Um, my host family and friends were wonderful, so I was lucky to stay with my host family, um, and I feel like I really got to know a lot more of the culture from, like, staying with a family, um, so that was amazing. Um, so encourage me to open my eyes, pretty cliche, but very, very true. So like, I mean like literally open my eyes. So when I'm walking through campus here, I'm always like on my phone, like texting, but like I, you know, couldn't because I didn't have service. So <laughs> I was like literally forced to open my eyes while I was like on the bus and while I was like walking. And it's like a beautiful thing. We should all try to do it sometime. Um, so yeah, um, notice I say encourage because I still catch myself doing that. And then allowed me to ask questions. So. I, you know, didn't really know anything, so I just would ask, like, the silliest questions, like, what I thought were silly. Um, but people were like, no, that's understandable, that you wouldn't know that. So I think that that's also something that I kind of take for granted, like, the fact that I'm not able to, like, ask questions here, like, I just Google it, because I'm like, well, I'll, like, find some sort of answer. Um, but I think that that's wonderful, that they were so open, and I'm sure you all feel the same way, that they were so genuine and so willing to, like, help you. Um, yeah, so that was very awesome. So that's all I have for you all. Um, but I just, again, want to thank you. And also thank you to everybody that came and let us share our stories for more than like two minutes. I'm sure we're all going to love this. Because everybody else is always like, how is India? And we talk for a minute and then we leave. So this is wonderful. So thank you to everyone. Thank you, Grace. Our next speaker is Aruran Chandraskar. Um, Aruran is a senior with a major in philosophy and a minor in mathematics. Hello, my name is Aruran Chandraskar and I'd like to tell you about my summer in South Asia. First of all, I'd like to thank Dave. You really, uh, this experience would be nothing without you and I'm really, really indebted to you. So it all began with an email from my Sanskrit professor. Four words stuck out to me, independent research in India. Reading that mail over, I wondered how far that word independent could go. I was a sophomore at the time, majoring in philosophy, minoring in math. Outside of class, my time was spent either writing or being entrepreneurial. 
Yet behind these pursuits, I always had the intention of entering the textile industry after I graduated. Of course, this is what came to mind when I thought about that word, independent. Thinking about India's near ubiquitous tailoring and haggling culture, I was interested in exploring how the youth culture that defines American fashion reflects in India. Then two things happened. First, I got rejected from the Summer in South Asia Fellowship. <laughs> then two weeks went by and somebody dropped out of the program. <laughs> Soon enough, there I was in India. Yet I immediately realized that there was no way to understand how or even if the youth culture drives its fashion without understanding the underlying socioeconomic phenomenon. It only made sense to start with the man most Indians trace their origins to, Mahatma Gandhi. Although many celebrate his nonviolent methods, most don't realize the ideals that justified them. Gandhi was averse to modernization, mechanization, and large-scale industrialization. Deriving his beliefs from Indian religious and ascetic practices, Gandhi promoted self-reliance and the minimization of dependency. Gandhi is also the father of Kadhi, a political movement that champions hand-spun and hand-woven cloth. Textile manufacturing was a central component of the Industrial Revolution. As a result of all the technological innovations, the British, the British machinery easily outrivaled its Indian counterparts. As a result, British textiles swept the Indian marketplace. Gandhi believed that his country could clothe itself. As a result, he began the Kadhi movement. Yet, due to its, due, due to its labor intensivity, low output, and meager quality, Kadhi began to employ millions of people at small scale without creating products that could compete internationally. Gandhi's other important role was much less direct. He was responsible for India's first prime minister, Jawaharlal Nehru. Under him, the country was determined to achieve self-sufficiency. A centrally planned economy was implemented where the currency itself was inconvertible, high tariffs prevented foreign goods from entering the market, and a massive bureaucracy required any organization to have a series of licenses before it could even engage in business. It was a paradigm case of anti-globalization and protectionism, and it culminated in India's 1990 economic crisis. Bailed out by the Western nations, India was forced to globalize its economy and remove its license raj. As a result, a, par the, a crazy amount of uh, uh, growth resulted afterwards. Yet, even after this point, the system remained structured in a way that only massive companies could grow at scale. As a result, the wealth disparity only grew. M companies such as Tata, Reliance, and Mahindra increasingly dominate India's market. What all these factors amount to is, is what, well, what all these factors amount to is that the current day Indian textile landscape is one that is not in favor of those at the small scale. Yet, because of Gandhi's precedence, it is one that was set that way. Yet, all these textile macroeconomics don't consider the individual factors that define the, the specific fiber markets. So. I chose to study silk. Although many are familiar with this luxurious final product, few really understand all it takes to produce a single item. Moths are first allowed to emerge from the previous generation of cocoons. After mating, females lay eggs. These eggs are then reared until insects spin new cocoons. These cocoons are then dried and stifled. Placed in boiling water, the cocoons then unravel into a single thread and reel into raw silk yarns. These yarns are then weaved into fabric, and this fabric becomes the base of luxury garments. At its most basic material biological definition, at its most basic material biological definition, silk is the strongest naturally occurring protein filament secreted by insects. Of this, 95% or about is produced by the mulberry silkworm, yet seven species remain commercialized. Of these, four are endemic to India: Muga, Tropical Tassar, Indian Oak Tassar, and Airy. I chose to focus on the Muga silkworm. Only accounting for 0.09% of global silk production. Muga silk, Muga silk is sustainably produced from natural fibers that are stronger than Kevlar. The fabric itself is biodegradable and reflects UV radiation, and just like other silks, it helps fight deforestation and has a myriad of uses in the cosmetic, biomedical, and pharmaceutical industries. Not only endemic to India, Muga silk production is confined to Northeast India. Intersecting mainland India with China and Southeast Asia, the region has been historically disconnected and is characterized by a large number of indigenous tribal communities. Following Bangladesh's independence in 1971, a huge number of illegal immigrants spilled over into the region. Armed separatist movements grew, and by the 1990s, the Indian Army was deployed to handle a few low-intensity military conflicts. Several insurgent groups still remain active in the region today. What this all amounts to is an undeveloped, extremely disjointed supply chain. Centuries-old tools and methods are used, while cocoon farmers remain at the mercy of egregious middlemen. In 2017, the average rearing family will make less than $300 a year. I thought about buying shoes that cost more than that. 
Although the government wants the production to multiply by 10 times in the upcoming decade, this will only happen at the, at the stagnance of a large number of rural communities. Introducing Silk Valley. Cocoon processing bottlenecks the supply chain. After worms are reared on outdoor plantations, the cocoons must be properly dried and stored before they're gradually reeled into yarns. With the current methods, cocoon quality inevitably degrades. Silk Valley will combat this problem in two ways. First, organizing rearing families into cooperatives, we will provide them all the necessary tools at the beginning of each season. Then, in a way similar to microfinancing, we will eliminate overhead by purchasing all their cocoons back at the end of the season. Alongside this, we will implement industrial scale cocoon sorting, drying, and storage. What this will do is we will be able to ensure that our cocoons will yield significantly more reliable thread. Alongside this, we will implement industrial, alongside this, we will implement methods so that we can make sure that cocoon waste goes down as well as degradation decreases. Adding to this, we will optimize distribution so that reeling centers can maximize productive capacity. What all this amounts to is a system where cocoon rearing families do no, no longer have to take financial risk and are incentivized to produce the best quality cocoons. This current segment of the industry currently employs 60,000 rural families, and that number is only going to shoot up in the oncoming decade. By, by, organizing region, by organizing communities that have, histor that have historically been confined to, to acute poverty, Silk Valley's social impact will be enormous. As a result, I dropped my math minor and compressed all of my remaining courses into this year. I'm going to finish a year early and then move to India after I graduate. Helping these communities has become my central concern, and I believe that one day, Muga Silk will stand at the forefront of sustainable luxury. Thank you. Thank you, Arun. Next up is Videhi Dangre, who is a junior majoring in international studies with a minor in business. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I would just like to say namaskar and welcome. Um, and I'd like to say thank you to Dan, um, Janelle, who has constantly supported us mentally, um, sometimes physically, um, <laughs> with everything. Thank you so much. Okay, so she already introduced a little bit about me, um, but I come from an Indian background. Um, although I've only visited India a few times, uh, I come from a family that speaks Marathi, um, which is spoken in Mumbai, Maharashtra, India. Uh, so I've grown up kind of speaking the language, um, and the research project that I decided on was uh, in the domestic maid industry. Um, to give you just a little bit of background on it, um, the International Labor Organization states that over 100 million people are employed in domestic work, um, which is like household work, so washing the dishes, cleaning the floors, stuff like that. Um, in India alone, uh, 50 million people are employed um, in this informal industry with a growth rate of 681% since 2001. Um, I actually decided uh, on this project from a story that I heard from my grandmother. Um, she used to visit sometimes and, and she would talk about her maid and taking naps together um, and having meals together. And I thought this was really strange because she was a person that grew up um, during the Gandhian per period. Um, so she was actually born before independence and she grew up in a very strict um, and Brahmin family. Um, to give you just a little bit of background on the caste hierarchy in India, um, I don't know how much you all know about it, um, but it basically is a way to classify people um, and classify their status um, within the community. Uh, so it goes Brahmin, uh, Kshatriya, which means warrior, um, Shud Vaishya, which means merchant, and then Sudra, which means servant. Um, so I wanted to do uh, some qualitative field work. Um, I, ha I did interviews. I interviewed 15 maids um, and then their respective 15 employers. Um, to kind of see if this caste um, issue was still prevalent in the way that they interacted with each other. Um, so the interviews were about 45 minutes to an hour each. Um, and I made sure that when I interviewed them, I interviewed them separately. Uh, so I would, for example, interview an employer and then after their maid was done working, we would walk to a street corner and have some tea or um, you know, sit on the steps of a building next door and kind of have a little conversation. 
another thing about my research that um, I thought really helped was that all the questions were the same. Um, I had a list of 21 questions that were same with the employer and the maid, just phrased in different ways. So an example of a question would be, um, have you ever received gifts from your employer? And then for the employer would be, have you ever given any gifts to your maid? And these were just some of the themes that were explored. Um, I'll re let you read that. Findings. Um, so I learned a lot um, more than uh, data and numbers. I have some numbers here. But I learned a lot from just the conversations that I was able to have um, with these people. Um, and this is kind of the maid's life structure. Um, on average, all the maids that I interviewed worked at between seven to eight houses um, per day. Uh, and the largest amount of houses that a maid worked was a Muslim maid that I talked to. She worked at 16 houses in one day. Um, her day started at 4.30 a.m. Um, and ended at 8 p.m. Um, and this lady that I spoke to had uh, four children, um, the youngest of which was six months. So that, um, and she was, the, she was not a single earner in the family, uh, but a lot of them are. And an issue that I ran into was when they started speaking um, about their families, they would kind of hesitate. Um, and they would ask, you know, are you going to say this to anyone? Um, and because I conducted the research in Marathi, um, it was harder for them to believe that I wasn't from here. Um, so, I, you know, I tried to explain to them, I'm going back. Um, I have to go to school. Uh, so I'm not going to be around here and I won't tell anyone, you know, about your problems. Um, but a lot of their husbands uh, are heavy drinkers. Um, you know, they kind of sit at home. Uh, they don't contribute, and even if they earn money, they don't contribute to the household income. So it's on these women, um, you know, to raise their children. Um, in terms of employment, uh, these are just some of the activities that they do. Um, and the relationship with the employer, something that I noticed was there was a very stark contrast um, between the middle class and the middle income families that are interviewed, and then uh, the higher income, which tend to be the IT professionals um, in India. So uh, the middle income families, all the women um, were around the range 50 to 60 years. Uh, some of them, you know, stayed home, some of them worked part time, um, and some of them had retired. Uh, and these women kind of had an interdependent relationship with the maid. So when I asked the maid or when I asked the women, it was more, you know, we have to adjust. Uh, that word was used a lot um, during the interviews, and it was used in English. So um, basically, it was that, okay, we need to work, um, and they are giving us work. So it's a give and take relationship. Um, that's different from the IT professionals that I spoke to. Um, both husband and wife work in the IT industry. You know, there are kids at home, there are, um, you know, in-laws at home that need to be taken care of. So there is a sense of dependency that I saw. Um, at the same time, though, they have so much disposable income that they were able to hire maids like that, fire maids like that. Um, so it was, you know, one day she makes me mad or one day, you know, she doesn't do the work right she's gone. I can just hire another one because I have so much money that I don't need to, you know, kind of haggle for rates. Um, and these were just some of the typical issues, um, you know, that I heard a couple stories about, and I'll elaborate on these later. Some limitations that I ran into, one um, that is not written here was mainly through language. Um, I spoke in Marathi, but a lot of the times um, I wrote the English questions down in English, and then I translated them. Uh, so one of the interviews that I did, the very first one actually, um, I, I said, you know, do you talk about anything besides work? Um, to us, that just seems like, okay, when you're chit-chatting, like when you go to work, sometimes you talk to your, you know, fellow colleagues. Is it like that? But to them, it sounded like, do you leave your work to go talk to your employer and hang out? So that was a big issue that I ran into. And these are just some of the other ones. I'm just going to spend a little bit of time talking about one of these. Um, I don't have time to talk about all of them, but uh, the most interesting one for me um, was Suman Tukaram Zore. Um, she was of caste uh, Maratha, and uh, this was a lady that didn't know how to sign her own signature, um, but she single-handedly was able to build her own house. Um, her husband had died, so she was a widow, and although she wasn't um, educated, these people have so much knowledge when it comes to observing, uh, observing that the, f the families that they work at, if the, if the mother or the father in the family is an accountant, they'll ask them about taxes or, or they'll ask them about, you know, giving them a loan. 
Um, so she was someone that I ran into that really, really kind of inspired me and um, really taught me a lot about knowledge in general. These are just some pictures. Um, I do uh, Kathak, which is an Indian classical dance, so I took some lessons over in India. Um, I had an amaz amazing experience, um, and I think the biggest takeaway for me was the throwaway versus uh, fixed attitude. <laughs> Over here, you know, if something goes bad, something goes wrong, we're just like, eh, I'll buy another one. It's fine. Over there, my aunt has used the same umbrella for the past 11 years. It is broken so many times, but there's this guy down on, this, um, on the side of the street that fixes it. So she's like, it's fine. You know, it's fine. Why do I need a new one? Uh, that was something that really kind of stuck with me even after coming back. There are more pictures. The food was really good, by the way. I know no one has talked about that yet, but I took a risk and ate out. <laughs> um, um, I don't think I have time for this one, but it's in my paper if you can read it. Um, so basically the two conclusions that I came across were, um, you know, there's two ways that this industry can go, which is now what I'm interested in. Um, one way is kind of like mechanized service, you know, they can get dishwashers like this because they have so much income now, um, a lot of people, they can kind of completely get rid of the need for maids. Another kind of way that this informal industry can go is become a formal one. So, you know, salary, um, you know, proper health care, um, a specified amount of leaves. These people work seven days a week. They don't have, you know, they're not allowed to take breaks. So I think those are the kind of two, two ways that could go, and I would really be interested in researching more about that um, because this was more an explorative study, so um, I didn't really get to get into the numbers and the business side of this, but that's something that I'd love to do. Um, and thank you um, to all these people, and also Professor Hull. Where are you? Hi, yes, um, Professor Hall, I didn't know you would be here today um, because I have a class with your wife and she said you were on leave. Um, <laughs> but um, thank you so much for helping me. Um, he kind of helped me narrow down on my topic and really talked, uh, talked it out with me, which was a really grueling process. So thank you so much for that. Um, so yeah, I think that's it. Thank you, Videhi. Our next speaker is Hannah Doherty. Hannah is a junior with a major in international studies and a minor in community action and social change. I'd also like to announce that Hannah is here today presenting on her birthday. So, so thanks for sharing the evening with us. Welcome again, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, my name is Hannah Doherty. I am 20 years old as of today. Um, I'm an international and comparative studies major with a minor in community action and social change. I embarked on my two month long journey to India um, on May 17th of this year. My first stop was Delhi, then the capital of the Himalaya Himalayan region, Leh Ladakh. A 20 hour bumpy jeep ride through the Himalayan mountains then Padum, the last town before my final destination. And then finally, two hours away from Padum, uh, the Zangla village, um, where I interned with the Jamyang Foundation at the Cham Changchab Cholang Nunnery. Uh, the Jamyang Foundation is an innovative education project um, that supports Buddhist girls and women um, in one of the poorest and most isolated parts of the world. I taught English to young nuns, ages three to 12, in the nunnery school for three hours every day um, for two months. These are my adorable students. <laughs> uh, the girls were filled with joy and a little bit goofy, creative and eager to learn, and always smiling. As a temporary member of the nunnery, I also had to contribute in other ways, like milking the cow, turning butter, polishing puja bowls, and whitewashing the clay cottages at the nunnery. Uh, the research I performed this summer was entitled A Practicum in Asking. Essentially, I wanted to create a comprehensive example of uh, community inquiry as a means of improving the work of uh, foreign aid organizations because the biggest issue in this sector 
is uh, poor communication with local peoples and not placing enough importance on native opinion. This leads to the unnecessary wasting of projects implemented by foreign aid groups because outsiders are coming in to help, but they may not be addressing uh, the specific problems that exist in these developing communities. By bringing to light the perceptions of local people uh, and, and their thoughts about foreign aid uh, workers and projects, uh, we would be recontextualizing the way in which we interact with our global community, uh, erasing the Western hero impoverished victim dichotomy, and putting power back into the hands of the communities that we seek to help. Um, my goal, I want to take the good intentions of humanity and help to channel them in such a way that they are actually adducing a positive life lasting effect. Uh, these were the interview questions that I used um, for my interviews. Uh, I, I interviewed roughly 30 individuals in uh, the town of Padum and also in Zangla village. I interviewed nuns and monks, <coughs> parents, college students, um, all different sorts of people. Um, through my interviews, I discerned quite a number of different negative manifestations of poor communication, not just uh, the squandering of uh, foreign aid projects. For example, oftentimes NGOs are not helping the right people. Uh, there is a dependency on foreign aid that leads to heightened expectations. Uh, oftentimes, NGOs attempt to change uh, traditional and functional parts of communities. There is a great lack of follow-up, um, and there are um, a lot of unqualified volunteers. As far as my uh, specific interview questions were concerned, um, these were the most prominent uh, responses that I, re I received. Uh, number one, government schools are performing very poorly. Um, teachers are not showing up to school. Uh, there is a great lack of resources. Um, and locals uh, equate education with private schools, usually funded by um, foreign organizations. Um, in this region specifically, there is an excess of volunteers in the summertime. Um, and that is not when uh, the people of this region need help. During the winter, um, temperatures drop to negative 20 degrees, um, people are isolated to their villages, and there are no volunteers that come to uh, the region of Zanskar in the winter. Um, a lot of the older generations uh, do not see the value in education, and this mentality kind of um, seeps into um, the younger generations. There is a new road being built uh, between Padum and Leh, which is the, the capital where the airport is, um, which would usher in a new wave of unprecedented modernization for the communities. Uh, so the locals expressed great interest in uh, awareness camps to uh, learn about the changes that might be coming. Um, and then finally, in Zangla village, a lot of the elders that I spoke to were interested in adult education classes. Um, I was very fortunate um, because in Zangla village there was a Hungarian organization. Um, I became very close friends with the volunteer coordinator for this organization and they were experiencing a great deal of tension with the villagers. All of their projects were failing. They did restoration work on the old Zangla palace which was covered up in cement. They were forbidden from entering the government school which th historically they have um, volunteered in. And they built a solar school a few years ago that was completely not being used, uh, save for drying cheese. Um, and this was due to poor communication, lack of attention, and no follow-up. Uh, but then I also had the opportunity to interview two directors of uh, a French organization called Edo Zanskar. Um, and they have succeeded in creating the most successful private school in the region of Zanskar. I interviewed the principal I interviewed um, and, and two of the directors of this organization um, and their their biggest ideal uh, is focusing on the power of suggestion instead of uh, and letting the the locals run the project um, one of the directors of the organization said when something is working you have a responsibility to keep it working whatever we do we must do it well otherwise we'd be spreading ourselves too thin and the quality of our work would be weakened it's like a tree if the roots are shallow and spread out too far the tree will fall if the roots are few and deep it will continue to grow larger and stronger with each passing year this is why we love what we do this is why it works um, at the end of my research I decided that there were three extremely important um, things that uh, foreign aid groups can do to improve their work Number one, volunteer screenings. Uh, number two, um, have NGO scouts that perform this sort of work. 
and finally working through local NGOs as a, as a point of contact with local people. Finally, I just want to thank uh, the Summer in South Asia Fellowship um, for giving me this opportunity of a lifetime to live meaningfully and with purpose, for showing me that smiles exist even during the most challenging times, for giving me laughter and love. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> for allowing me to engage in a once in a lifetime experience. <laughs> for teaching me the value of friendship and for giving me family. So thank you. Thanks, Hannah. Next up is Matthew Gradenus. Matt is a sophomore pursuing a degree in political science with um, the intention on going on to med school. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Matthew Gradenus, and my project was entitled First Do No Harm, The Safety, Affordability, and Effectiveness of Mobile Health Care in India. Um, a little bit more about me, uh, as Janelle said, I'm a sophomore, uh, I'm studying political science, but I am hoping to go to med school. Um, I hope to get my medical degree and work in reconstructive plastics, uh, which I hope to use in mission work, possibly to India in the future. Um, first of all, why did I choose the summer in South Asia? Um, it was for a variety of reasons. One is because it was on an email that was accidentally sent to me instead of another student. Um, <laughs> But also because I have a love of travel, adventure, and exploration. Um, and CISA gave me an opportunity to combine my passion about medicine with that and immerse myself in one of the most radically different cultures uh, from America anywhere in the world. Um, I also had a fascinating project focus, which allowed me to kind of look into a really pressing and important topic, which was mobile health care, uh, a growing uh, delivery of health care within the world, especially in uh, underdeveloped countries. So I spent my time aboard the Lifeline Express, uh, which is the world's first hospital on a train. It's staffed with volunteers and uniquely funded by an Indian law that requires organizations making over a certain amount of money to donate a part of their profit to an NGO within the country. Because of this, mobile health care and nonprofit mobile health care has surged within the country. And the Lifeline Express is one of the best examples. Um, it actually celebrated its 25th anniversary while I was aboard the train and has not only been awarded by the UN, but also by countless world leaders. Um, it's an incredible program, and while I was aboard, I was able to help with pre- and post-operative care, organize documentation, and observe some of the operations that took place on board. In fact, the Lifeline Express has become so effective that it spurred the same type of program not only in Australia, but also a boat-based version in Taiwan. Um, so, as I was saying, I looked at the safety, affordability, and effectiveness of mobile health care to see if it's actually a good way of providing care to the people who need it. And I definitely had some pros and cons. Um, in terms of cons, when it comes to safety, the Lifeline Express was incredibly unsanitary. Um, like much of India, no morphine was used in any of the procedures we did, which could be not only scary, but also sometimes really intense. Um, we also used antiquated procedures, which you would never see performed in the United States, because we simply didn't have the equipment or tools to go out into the most rural of areas and perform high-tech procedures. However, the post-operative care put on by this program was incredible, and not only did we have programs to raise awareness, such as introducing toothbrushes to a community for the first time, or talking about epilepsy to clear up some of the misconceptions about it, but many of the doctors aboard the train also tried to teach individuals within the area so that they could be a sustainable village once we left the tracks. In terms of affordability, the Lifeline Express often cut corners like many uh, missionary health organizations in order to provide to as many people as possible. This sometimes resulted in an occasional lack of supplies, such as IV bags or important medications, but it wasn't really something we could avoid. Uh, the pros of this, however, are that the program is very inexpensive, roughly 100,000 uh, estimated U.S. dollars per project. With 12 projects a year, this is just over a million dollars, which is almost one-twelfth of what it would cost in the United States. As you can see, this program is uh, built on the emphasis of quantity over quality to try and reach as many people as possible. Um, in terms of effectiveness, the unregulated quote-unquote field medicine that we practice, as I said before, was antiquated and sometimes incredibly hard to watch, but it did provide care to the people who needed it, who needed it most. Um, in fact, this is important when we consider 
that over 60% of the Indian population does not have access to any form of health care. This is more than six times the United States average, and for the second largest population of any country in the world, it's almost unacceptable. This is largely due to a lack of infrastructure, and while many people in the United States may want to try and conform the Indian medical system to that of uh, nations like the United States or Britain, um, we can see that this isn't always the best answer. India is so rural and uniquely diverse that hospitals simply aren't the solution to the problem. Instead, programs like Lifeline Express that go out into the heart of the most rural areas and provide care to those who need it most may be the answer. However, when looking to see if mobile health care would be applicable in the United States, we can see that it would need to go un undergo a huge overhaul in order to go up to United States regulations or standards in order to operate on any patients. So uh, if you kept up with my blog, you know that my trip uh, consisted of getting stranded, sick, uh, climbing mountains, and almost an arranged marriage. Uh, but it also impacted me in three kind of large aspects. Uh, professionally, my trip taught me how to market myself as an intern and deeply immersed myself in my field of interest. I worked by doctors 10 hours a day for almost five weeks, which was an incredible experience to not only see how doctors of a different culture work, but also how patients respond to healthcare. Academically, my research pushed me to become an observant, thoughtful, and thorough researcher of complex issues, especially because only one other person on the entire train spoke English, meaning that most of my observation and data collection had to either be translated or simply using anything I could find aboard the train personally, though, was probably the greatest impact. My experience transformed my worldview, especially of other cultures. It challenged my quick thinking and taught me about myself. I had to think on my feet. I was put in sometimes intense situations, and I also had to learn how to carry myself, even when you have a horrible, horrible, confusing day in India. Um, so finally, I'd like to give a thank you to Janelle and Dan, who not only took our 3 a.m. phone calls when we were stranded or sick or didn't know where we were going, but uh, also to our generous donor. It would be too little of me to say that he simply made this experience possible. Um, our donor dropped me in the middle of a desert in India, uh, made me climb mountains, got me sick more times than I can count, and almost got me engaged. But what he also did is give me an incredible life-changing experience. He believes in this program, and after being a part of it, I can honestly say that I believe in the work he's doing. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Our next speaker is Sam McMullen. Sam's a senior majoring in cellular and molecular biology and philosophy. Hey, how's everybody doing? Holding up? Good? Yeah? All right. Um, great. Awesome. So my project this summer, I spent four months, three and a half months, um, shooting a documentary, um, following a t-shirt, looking for titles. <laughs> if anyone, is this good? Um, uh, if anyone has any idea. Um, so I'd never shot a documentary. I was a cellular molecular biology major, dropped that. Um, I'm a philosophy major only now, and um, well, well, we'll get to the, <laughs> we'll save it for the end. Um, so the idea was my sister and I had started this organization called Live Zero Waste. Um, centered around sort of living without trash, the fix-it model, that, that was great. Um, uh, we're all about that, and so we're doing environmental journalism to sort of back that up. Um, so what is the actual impact of creating something like, say, a t-shirt, or we were initially looking for any product, um, what's the impact of creating it elsewhere and then importing it? Um, is that reflected in the, like, six ninety nine price that you might pay for a white t-shirt? Um, so we went and we, we followed it and we looked through it. Um, so we chose a t-shirt because basically it touches more things than many other kinds of products. So a straw might touch the manufacturing and shipping, but um, t-shirts have agriculture, they have human labor, they have all kinds of other stuff um, that make them sort of the ideal uh, environmental life cycle analysis. Um, so I started out, I went to Delhi, flew into Delhi and did two months of research um, learned on the job. I, I had no idea what I was doing. Um, never tried journalism or really <laughs> like video. I took a photography class. Um, YouTube helped me out a lot. Um, I did a lot of research. I went into my first interview um, and just sort of like vomited out my main questions <laughs> at the guy and he was like, hey listen, um, 
let's order a coffee, let, tell me about your project, what are you doing, I have no idea what's going on. Um, that interview actually ended up being sort of crucial in taking our project to the next level. Um, it was with a union organizer who, um, I'll just give you something to look at, um, I took pictures while I was there. Um, the, uh, this also sort of represents how the research was, sort of untangling <laughs> a lot of different threads. Um, but he was a union organizer, and that ended up being the tack that we would take the whole time. So our um, basic strategy was, after trying many different and failing at many different other strategies, basic strategy was talk to a union doing the step of the process of producing a t-shirt um, that we wanted to get access to, offer to provide them with a video for union recruitment purposes, and then uh, get the access that way. Um, and it worked out really, really well. So this is what I, after, after two months of research, this is what I learned, um, which you would get from sort of a cursory look at Wikipedia. But um, <laughs> basically, I, I learned pretty in depth what was going on in India with all of these and where you would have to get access to get video. So a lot of things in this industry, you know, it's, it's had a lot of news coverage with, uh, um, it's basically sweatshops we're dealing with, right, um, in the knit, dye, stitch, or the dye and stitch mostly. Um, so that's a really difficult place to get access and that's what you want to do as a documentary uh, filmmaker, give you something to look at. Um, so did everyone, everyone cool with that? Cotton through selling, yeah. Um, so we, Actually, you, you're sort of catching me mid-project because we've gotten footage of some of these, um, but um, this project is, the reason I don't have any videos right now is because we're still getting footage and this project is, I'll be editing for a year, so hopefully get it out by a year from now. And um, we're going, my sister's going back to get footage, I did this all with my sister, going back to get footage um, in January. And we'll, we'll talk about uh, another, <laughs> I have another surprise for you in the production segment. Um, so what is it like to produce the, this video? So the, the third month, third and a half month, my sister joined me for this. This is um, sort of an analogy. She's my big sister. Um, <laughs> this is how I felt a lot of the time. <laughs> Help, Lynn. Um, so what is it like to produce a documentary in India? A lot of it was like run and gun stuff. We'd make promises. This is a big lesson, biting off more than you can chew. Always do it. It's great. Um, we promised someone, yeah, we'll be in your city for an interview in like uh, tomorrow at whatever time, and then we'd figure out the train tickets or like figure out the motorcycle or whatever it was, however we could get to that place. Um, because at a certain point, it just became if we had access, if there was a chance that we were going to get the footage we needed, we just made it happen, um, which is a really fun style of life and gets you traveling all over the place. We um, at one point we slept we slept on the side of the road twice. Um, it was it was a real great adventure. Um, so let me before you get to look at that. Um, we so we were started in Delhi, moved to Bangalore because it was a much more heavily unionized place um, for the the hardest step, which is getting the stitching. Um, so we moved to Bangalore to be in contact with the unions there, and then did all of our research, sort of branching out from Bangalore. Um, Tamil Nadu is where they do a lot of this spinning. We went north to Raichur where they did cotton growing, talked to farmers about what it was like to, like what BT cotton or um, uh, genetically modified cotton was doing to their um, uh, their whole agriculture system. There's some intense stuff going on uh, to say the least and hopefully it'll be reflected in the documentary eventually. Then we headed um, northwest to Mumbai and um, to get the shipping step. So this was a huge challenge. This was the chai guy on the train. Um, and uh, so it was a huge challenge because that's like, they have military on those docks. We ended up having to sort of take footage from a separate little jetty um, of the ship. So we didn't get what we wanted to. We wanted to actually take a boat home um, with the t-shirt. Well, biting off more than we could chew. Um, so what are the next steps? Like I said, my sister will go back and shoot in January. I will start to edit, and um, we have people in factories right now uh, going in with pen cam. So workers will go in, they'll have a pen in their pocket, and um, they'll get footage that way and send it through to us. So that's an ongoing process. So caught me in the middle of it. It's great. Um, that's the, w hopefully what we'll do at the end. Yes, finish the documentary. 
But um, in closing, I just want to say I came into this program as a pre-med student, don't have the same passion for it that he does. This, <laughs> like, it gave me an opportunity to do a project, but mostly it, it defined my career. I think, like, I couldn't have imagined doing this before, and now it's pretty much the only thing I can imagine doing. So I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Next up is Hannah Fershey. Hannah is a junior majoring in biomedical engineering. Before I start, um, hi guys. Like uh, uh, Janelle said, I'm a junior in biomedical engineering. Um, I'll get over the mic there, guys. Um, first off, I would like to apologize if um, I start talking too fast because I could talk about my project for over an hour and I don't have that long. So, um, and I love it, so I really want to get as much information and tell you guys about it as much as I can. But, so, so again, um, that's me. Um, my in uh, so, actually, I'm a yoga instructor, which is how I got interested in um, my project that I got started on, and then also in India, because that's where it started. Uh, and so I volunteered at uh, the Institute of Applied Dermatology. It is a nonprofit. Um, outpatient facility treating uh, lymphedema is their main treatment, but they do lots of skin diseases, um, STDs, and um, uh, dermatology, dermatology um, diseases. Um, I could, sorry guys, I could talk for about just the, the things they do there is so amazing and how they run it is um, crazy. So my volunteer, actually, I also did research for them, which was my volunteer work for them. I worked, um, I started on the pioneering of a study um, doing yoga poses to um, relieve uh, respiratory distress due to asthma and allergens in rural school children. Um, so that's what I was doing um, my time there um, working for them during the day. Um, and then also my research project, um, the, the above, the first one was kind of what I started with and then the second one is um, when I got there what I saw what I could actually do. So mine um, was looking into what aspects of IAD's integrative um, medical treatment for lymphedema um, are from which medicinal practice and um, what makes the specific combination beneficial and successful in their community. Um, so I will get in, oh yeah, to, um, they're an integrative dermatology institute. I will get more on that. So first off, um, since my project focused on lymphedema because that's our most commonly treated disease, I want to give you a quick um, update on what that is. Um, so lymphatic fluid um, goes throughout your whole body. It um, cleanses the body, um, gets rid of disease, those type things, um, gets um, filtered through your lymph nodes. And what happens is lymphedema is when it can't um, properly get drained from um, back into the circulatory system. This can happen um, from birth defects, um, damage to nodes, which can happen from mastectomies. Um, most commonly in India, um, they're treated from uh, mosquito bites that um, have a certain worm that uh, can then damage the um, lymph system. And then this causes um, extreme swelling and inflammation in limbs. It can happen all over the body, but you mainly see it in the legs. Um, so this is what it is. Um, so their process for um, uh, treating this disease, again, it's an outpatient facility. Um, so they don't stay there over the night. They um, come, they pay whatever they can for their rooms, and um, they get treated during the day. Um, so there, it starts, um, it's a 14 to 21 day consult, um, treatment. So it starts with the consultation, talking about the disease, um, what it is, what they do there, because um, obviously integrative treatment is uh, confusing, and you really want to make sure people, that's what they want. <laughs> So um, then a doctor collaboration between um, all the doctors of the different disciplines. Um, there's patient education, um, cleansing of the, and then the actual um, physical treatment is what we would think of treatment is um, cleaning of the limb, a fan to soak, um, infection point entry care, um, pre um, uh, <laughs> manual lymph drainage yoga, um, and then limp, manual lymph drainage, um, compression bandages, post yoga, and um, a diet protocol. So um, these are some photos. Sorry, I forgot to warn you if you're a little bit queasy. Uh, sorry. <laughs> I forgot to give that at the beginning. Um, so a little few things. Um, so th this is um, a few things from the process. Um, so cleaning of the limbs, um, infection care, um, the Fanta Soak, which is um, an Ayurvedic powder to help with um, skin cleansing based on the different skin conditions um, because there can be um, psoriasis or um, thickening of the skin. Um, each patient is different based on um, it can be a bunch of conditions, but um, the outside of the skin and the inside is different for every single patient. Um, so that's what they uh, cater the um, Fanta Soak to do that. And then infection care, which I will change the slide because I know that's kind of gross. But um, the infection care, um, as you can see from the first picture, um, with massive swelling of the legs, there are lots of folds <laughs> that can happen in the leg. And then if it gets wet, 
um, improper care, it can easily be infected and then all of their uh, treatment processes have to stop. So that's why they try to treat it. Um, and then compression bandages, yoga, um, the one in the middle is um, actually the, so IMLD is Indian Man Manual Lymph Drainage, which is um, a very particular process of um, it's just a manual massage of the limb to um, like kind of what it says, manually drain the limp from the leg instead of the, um, having the circulatory system do it. <laughs> so, and then a little bit more on integrative medicine and what it actually is. So it's um, practicing medicine in a way that um, selectively incorporates elements of complementary and alternative medicine into comprehensive treatment plans alongside, alongside solidly orthodox methods of diagnosis and treatment. So um, again, so what it consists of is allopathy, uh, Western biomedicine is what we all know, what we all see. Um, you go in, they, based on your symptoms, they tell you you have something, you take meds, you go home. Um, and usually um, it's also um, very harsh treatments. Um, our drugs are extremely, can be extremely toxic to the body. Have you noticed um, all of your drugs have side effects um, on every single bottle that you take? Um, but uh, we don't care because it's quick, it's easy, um, it'll get the job done. Um, so it's pros and there are pros and cons to every single one. Um, and then the complementary and alternative medicines are um, things that are more commonly practiced in India. Um, so yoga is w uh, something that I'm interested in and that's um, physical postures um, mostly, but then there's also um, meditation and it's also, it can be a spiritual and a lifestyle choice, but I'm mostly looking at it as a, a treatment. So um, that's physical postures and um, yeah, I think you guys have a good general idea of what yoga is. It's kind of popular now. <laughs> so, um, and then homeopathy is something people are less known, um, know less about. It's kind of hard to describe. I'm still kind of um, fuzzy on what it actually is. Um, they go on the idea that like treats like. And um, the way they describe it, they described it to me, um, the homeopathic doctor, is um, so they would, if you're sick with something, they would give you the medication that would make a healthy person sick with your disease. So um, it's kind of, it's hard to understand. I still don't really get it. And then Ayurveda is, um, oh, Ayurveda is really hard to describe and it's so amazing because it started in India. And it, um, it basically is balancing of the entire body. Instead of um, creating imbalances, they believe that sickness is caused by imbalances. And by treating um, certain parts, feeding you different things, um, it can bring your body back into balance between um, like fire, earth, and water, um, all of your elements within the body. So um, my results, um, so of the different parts that uh, consisted, um, you can see, so the allopathy is basically their, um, uh, the organization, and um, through their organization, they, were a lot, they um, became more uh, viable. Um, so they can actually uh, print out and um, do research and seem real, because um, sometimes Ayurveda has that problem, is um, people think it's hokey pokey, because um, there's just like not a lot of um, structure to it. So, and then also quantifying the results to actually prove that it's right. And the Ayurveda is actually a lot of the treatment process because that's what um, Indian people believe in. That's still their main form of medicine and that's um, what they trust. Um, so that's why it's more trusted in that community. So that's the Fanta powder, Fanta powder the um, Indian soaks, the oils used in the massage, the compression techniques, medications prescribed, and the process. Um, and then yoga is um, to, again, help with the manual lymph, dra uh, lymph drainage and then um, keeping the muscles engaged and um, keeping the joints um, oiled up and lubricated because um, obviously if your leg is so swollen, you don't use it that often. And then homeopathy is um, helping with the talking at the beginning, looking at all the patient's backstory, and then also um, the diet uh, recommendations at the end. So I wanna show you some results from their treatment um, and how much it worked. Um, something, again, like a process that you guys might not believe in, I honestly wholeheartedly believe in now, is um, just, how amazing it is. Um, here's another one. Again, like it's 55 days and um, it's a process that can dramatically increase someone's um, expect life expectancy and also quality of life. Um, here's some more. Sorry, I love, <laughs> I love these. <laughs> um, so uh, why it works in this community is um, because it combines all the benefits um, and picks the, bright, uh, the best from each ones. It, um, Again, like I was saying earlier, the allopathic makes it um, viable, and so um, it makes it more trustworthy by the entire uh, world, um, especially through their publications. Um, also, the CAM practices make it um, low cost and without adverse side effects and non-invasive, which is very important to this community where they need to pay as little as possible, get in, get out, and go back to their lives, as everyone's been talking about. Um, they, they have to do their own things, and um, sometimes taking care of your own, yourself isn't a priority. 
Uh, so they're also, because it's outpatient, they're taught um, patient care. Um, they teach it themselves. That's why it's only 14 to 21 days. It makes it low cost again. And um, then they can give, give, give back to their lives and they can continue treating it since it's chronic. So um, this way they don't need to constantly come back um, for treatment. They can figure out how to do it themselves and then they can continue doing that treatment for the rest of their lives. Um, also through the consulting, they feel comfortable and knowledgeable in control of their disease, which is something Ayurveda wouldn't give them because um, it's not diagnosed in the same way we do it. So it gives them a better understanding of what is actually happening to their body. And um, then also all these factors maximize their treatment. Um, like I said, I was working in a rural area, so um, they don't have any of the um, things that we have and everything they did dedicated to um, helping their patients and making it best for them. So um, yeah, that was mine. Um, so I wanted to say thank you to the donor. Thank you, Dave. Um, it was we all try to say what happened to us in India and there's just no way to put it into words whatsoever because ugh, like, you can't force it into words about what happened to you. And um, I want to thank um, Janelle, Dan, everything was amazing. Um, I know I went over time, but um, talk to me. <laughs> talk, anybody talk to me more later because um, I can talk to this even longer. Like I can tell you so much more about everything and I would love to talk to people about it. So anyway, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Hannah. Hannah. Our next speaker is India Solomon. India is a junior majoring in pu public policy with a minor in crime and justice. Hi, everyone. Yes, my name is, in fact, India. That caused me a lot of trouble when I was actually in India. People were like, no, you're lying. I don't trust you. What do you mean? Um, but yes, yeah, so here's my summer in South Asia. I focus on mental health education and early childhood development at the Bubble School for Autism. Who am I? As Janelle said, I'm a senior in public policy. I'm focusing on comparative urban policy and development. I do have a tentative crime and justice minor right now. Um, as many of us have already said, this trip really has changed my life, so I might not be able to finish that minor because I'm completely switching from a pre-law track um, and I'm interested in public health now. Um, my mother was born in India, but she hasn't been back since she was seven. So I was the first in my family to return to India over the past 10 years. It's really awesome. Um, why did India want to go to India? So this is a quote that I picked up from <laughs> one of the markets in Goa. One of the merchants says, you speak Hindi, you look Indian. You are like my sister, I give you Indian price. <laughs> so I did not go to India to get Indian price, but I did go to explore my own international roots um, and to use those roots to gain a deeper understanding of my major, which focuses on development economics. And finally, I wanted to add a global component to my academic career. Up until now, I hadn't studied abroad, and that's something I definitely wanted to do before graduation. So I interned at the Bubble Center. I did research. I mostly volunteered for their summer camp, and I helped out with program development. Um, I actually did a lot of the photography, um, so I was kind of behind the scenes, but they did sort of throw me in, and I did a lot of work with the kids. Um, so the bubble school began with one woman named Sarbani, and it flourished into a full-blown school with the help of investments from my host parents. So she began teaching lessons outside of her home. Um, she was getting tons and tons of students, wasn't able to give the students uh, the attention that they needed because she was only functioning out of one room in one home. So she expanded in, into a school. So the bubble center offers art therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, movement and theater, cooking and sports, and um, they only teach 41 children, and this is because they are not government funded. If they were government funded, they would be expected to have a much higher child to student, sorry, student to teacher ratio. Um, and Sarbani says, if I had only one room, I would see only one child. So she's very much focused on quality edu of education over quantity of students. My research question was, well, uh, what al alternative methods of education are being implemented to improve future pros prospects for children on the autism spectrum in Bangalore, India? So basically, what are students going on to do after the bubble school? My methodology was failing at my initial research proposal. It was very ambitious. Um, very much, I only had a four week period um, and it was very intrusive. So I kind of had to step back, be a bit more modest in my approach. And I ended up conducting interviews with a small random sample of faculty members. I observed three of the students closely. They were all on different um, parts, different stages in the autism spectrum. Um, and I wanted to use those observations to see what sorts of expectations are set for, ch for children with autism and how do those expectations differ from those set for typically developing children. 
And ultimately, I wanted to construct a way to define success for autistic children and then determine quali qualitatively based on my own personal experience and interviews with staff members what were the factors that lead to this, um, this definition of success for, for the children at the bubble school. So I underwent an immense amount of personal, professional, and academic growth. I gained a deeper understanding of my own family and my own cultural heritage and the colonial history of India. I strengthened my academic interest in international studies and development issues, made meaningful professional connections with the staff at Bubbles, um, and I did learn the challenges of running a nonprofit. Um, they go through a lot of crap, and especially since the Bubble School doesn't take government funding, it's very, very hard for them to get to get the support that they need. You can kind of see that I mean, the school itself is beautiful, but if you go into their back rooms, the records are all in papers and you have these stacks of folders you know, that are like 10 feet high for all the students that have been there. They haven't yet mechanized everything yet. And so it's definitely hard to keep track of stuff, but the work that they're doing is just, it's so amazing. Um, and finally, I developed an interest in mental health and population health, which is in turn encouraged me to pursue a path in public health and not a terrible path in law. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so I wanted to end with a quote from my host mother. She says, what you're experiencing, the people, the traffic, the smells, is sensory overload. This is what children with autism struggle with every day of their lives. Um, so this really meant a lot to me because India, it, it was a, an amazing experience. But as Dave said, it is a country of contrasts and it's a lot to take in. And this quote really helped me kind of ground my own experience, but also gain a deeper understanding of what the children I was working with every single day were going through. So thank you. Sorry. There we go. Thank you so much, all of you, Janelle, Dan, Dave. This was all just amazing. Janelle was always there on call whenever we needed anything. Throughout the entire process, I was in her office every other week, pretty much. Um, and Dan was there being supportive, commenting on our blog posts, making me feel like I was <laughs> writing good things. So <laughs> yes, thank you all so much. And that's it. Thank you, India. Um, next up is Madeline Stagner. Madeline is a junior with a major in elementary education. Hi. Um, so my name is Madeline Stagner, and I am a junior in the elementary ed program, majoring in language arts. My long-term goal is to become an education policymaker and really focus on inequity in education and how we can better bridge those gaps. Um, Lots of rice. Rice, three <laughs> meals a day. I survived on rice and peanut butter. I think that's peanut butter and chapati. So good, so good. Um, okay, so my NGO is called Sparsha. It's a nonprofit organization dedicated to providing every child in need with care, protection, and education. Okay, this picture I just have to tell you. So this little girl in the corner, her name is Malika. I was asleep. So at some point in this trip, they figured out the passcode to my phone. So throughout the course of the day, I'd find like snapshots, like hundreds of pictures. So this was her posing with me. There were like a series of four or five of her just kind of in the corner. Um, absolutely hilarious. So Sparsha is, Sparsha's most recognized programming centers around reintegrating children into mainstream education through residential programming. Um, this was my life at Sparsha. So initially my plan was to live with my host parents, the couple who runs the NGO. Um, I got dropped off at this shelter at 3 a.m. in Sanjeevini Nagar and I never left. I absolutely fell in love with the girls and I just didn't ever want to be apart from them. Um, I decided it was really important to be immersed in the culture of the girls that I was working with and lived there the whole time. Approximately 85% of the students were under 15 years old and I worked mostly with the younger kids. So these are more pictures. Sparsha Trust is currently in the process of finishing their new shelter in Nisarga Grama. They aim to fill the library with 20,000 books. For a small portion of my internship, I worked to prepare fundraising materials such as letters and pamphlets for this endeavor. Uh, for the majority of my internship, though, my job was to read with and tutor the girls. I spent several hours a day reading English books with them. Okay. So 
the only album I had on my computer was Beyonce's Lemonade. So, um, yeah, thanks to Shannon. So the girls are very well versed now on Beyonce. They're like all caught up. Um, very exciting for them. Um, so here's an image of the model used by Sparsha to facilitate re-entry into mainstream education and provide the tools necessary for long-term success. They're using education as a tool to break the cycle of poverty among the students. This process guides students towards this goal as part of a residential program. This programming will support students through college or vocational training. They really support them on either endeavor. Um, Sparsha has rehabilitated more than 1,200 working in street children and also enrolled them into local government schools with a success rate of 72%. So this is my research question. I relied heavily on observational and qualitative research, and perhaps one of the most interesting parts for me of Sparsha was that not all the kids were orphans, so I worked at a shelter, but half of the kids had no stable home, no one to, no guardianship. Um, and then the other half were typically child, lab child laborers, so they had families, they grew up in slums. Um, one of the girls I got really close with worked three different jobs in addition to going to school, and Sparsha allowed her the opportunity to really focus on her education, and now she's top in her English class, and was she did most of the communicating for me. She's a brilliant, brilliant girl. Um, yeah, so my observational research was constant and relied heavily on note-taking. The, these are the two biggest things I saw in the girls. They were so determined. Anytime anyone came, there was something challenging to understand. They sat in the front row. They were constantly engaged, and they really understood the value of education. And they talked so much about their dreams, their aspirations in the future. I mean, it was constantly on their mind and constantly in our conversations. Um, so this is Rupa, and she is who I relied on most for my qualitative research. Um, she was interesting. So. For us, I think coming with a Western perspective, she was a little bit aggressive, so she told the kids all the time, no jumping. No ju I don't know why jumping. I couldn't quite figure that one out. Um, but she was very, anytime she walked in the room, no jumping, no jumping. The kids could be sitting still, and she would still talk about jumping. Um, her love for the children, though, was evident. She rewarded their progress with hugs and praise. And um, one key thing about Sparsha is they provide a year of non-formal academic rehabilitation before enrolling the children in formal education. So Ruba is a year-round, actually, volunteer, comes for several hours a day to read with the kids. Um, my initial questioning, I explicitly asked Rupa how much of a difference she thought residential programming made in bridging the academic gap, um, and her she answered rather pragmatically. If they do not live here, they spend 40 minutes doing nothing instead of reading and they are 40 minutes behind. You cannot get back those 40 minutes of lost learning. So beyond the relatively simplistic idea of lost learning, she focused on the distractions and lack of support or ability to help at home. According to her, almost all the kids' parents were illiterate. So it wasn't even so much that they didn't want to support their kids, it's that they were unable to. So Sparsha provided them that support, that academic support and emotional support to really ensure that they did well in school. Um, so this is Kavitha, and it was very exciting while I was there. She passed her 10th grade standards that Grace explained to you. She actually well surpassed them, um, did an awesome job, and she was a kid who was a child laborer, grew up on a construction site with her mom. Um, so overall, my observations and interviews support the conclusion that residential programming plays a pivotal role in facilitating reintegration into mainstream education as well as sustainable progress and achievement. Um, I'm going to be a teacher. I learned how to cope with chaos in India. The students didn't learn how to read phonetically, so I did lots of clapping and rhythm-based stuff with them. Um, I thought I understood the power of education to change lives, and I didn't. My internship with Sparsha taught me the capacity of education to be the single most powerful tool in changing a child's life. Um, I would like to thank Matt for getting me stranded at a train station at 3 a.m. And we, the three of us, traveled together. I'd like to thank Arurin for catching his clothes while I fell down the stairs with our laundry. Um, and <laughs> I'd like to thank Janelle for encouraging me and allowing me to vent to her. And I'd like to thank the donor for providing me with the opportunity that has changed my life and will continue to change the lives of my students for years to come. Um, and then this is just a cute. I, the girls didn't know how to blow kisses. <laughs> Go. <laughs>
Thank you. Thanks, Madeline. Our next and last speaker is Sukuma, Sukumo Niwa. Sukumo is a senior double majoring in oboe performance and international studies. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. My name is Sukumo, and I'm going to be talking about my seven-week experience in Varanasi, India, working with Nirman the NGO in Varanasi. <coughs> I should use a clicker. Maybe. Okay. Sorry about that. So a little bit more about me. My name is Tsukumo again, and I am a dual degree student in LSA and School of Music Theory and Dance, ma uh, majoring in um, oboe performance and international studies. I also have a minor in CASC, Community Action and Social Change. I'm interested in performing arts of all kinds. I'm a musician by training, but I love going to all kinds of different kinds of performances. And I'm also pretty active as a social justice advocate and educator on campus. So why did I want to become a CISA fellow? I was really interested in going to India. This was my first time in South India, uh, South Asia, India, indeed. And I really admired India for its richness of culture and performing arts and just the diversity within a country. And my biggest question that I had about the country was, how can art and social justice intersect in this kind of diverse, unique environment that is India? So a little bit about the host NGO that I was with. Um, its name is Nirman. It's located in Varanasi, India. And they, they have a couple of components that um, they really focused on in their work, which includes research, education, international exchange, and art studio. And I worked mostly with the education sector of their work. So the education sector works really, um, education sector is centered on Vidyashram, the South Point School, and its administration. The school was founded in 1990. It's a private K through 12 school, so people can apply and pay to be in the school. They have a lot of programs, however, to um, diversify the um, school population, including the students and the teachers, and making sure students get the support they need, whether it be food, um, money, or um, like in terms of tuition support. Um, and religious holidays, um, observances, all of that to make sure that um, a diverse array of students and teachers can be there um, to make the school, pop school population. And one of the biggest aspects of Nirman is the activities, uh, their focus on activity-based learning. So this is an educational concept developed um, post-World War II by some of the British um, veterans who were exploring some educational reform in India. And activity-based learning approach is very child-centered and tailored to meet the needs of e each and every child. They come from diverse backgrounds. Some of them might have um, parents that can really help them read and grow and all of that, dedicate a lot of their time. Some of their parents don't even read. So really tailoring to the needs of each and every one of those children. And um, in nature, it is a progressive approach to Indian education. So my question um, for my research was, how does ABL, uh, activity-based learning, impact students and teachers at Nirman? The example that I used, especially in my research, was the music classes at Nirman. Um, they happen twice a week for grades 1 through 10. And teachers um, include those two over there. Um, in, uh, some teachers are trained in classical music, classical Indian music, um, and some international interns, um, including myself, and some others that were there, um, train some um, or give some music classes to the students there as well. To the right is me playing the oboe for the students in class 9. So here's a little clip of the music class uh, taught by Ashish sir and Triloki sir, um, who is on the tabla and harmonium. How do I play this video? <laughs> I'm so sorry about that.
Thank you. So what you just heard is a little clip of a song about the monsoon season. I was there in June and July when the rain season was just starting, and um, it's a local song in uh, popular in Varanasi. So a little bit about my findings through this research. Um, so we did um, some qualitative as, quantita uh, as well as qualitative. So we had some students fill out the survey as well as some teachers through their interviews. And we saw that students can really tell the difference between the traditional and Vidyasram curricula. Um, some students might have transferred from um, more traditional Indian schools, and they can really tell that Vidyasram cur curriculum, even if they don't know what exactly those um, pillars are in their curriculum, they can really tell that it makes a difference in how they see the world. Teachers also enjoy acting as a role model and supporters for students. So. Um, in Nirman, uh, teachers are encouraged to really be the supporters of students instead of being this condescending figure um, as seen in a lot of other um, traditional in Indian school systems. Activity-based learning in general really integrates students with different learning abilities and lets students take ownership of their learning. And these two I really saw through the music classes that I both got to observe and teach. This, ex uh, this experience has made a huge impact on me. Um, I basically went through so many reflex reflective moments of privilege and uh, modern Indian history and Indian music, spirituality, all of these things are the um, thoughts that I had before I going in, but it really made me grow as a person in general for this experience. And finally, I just wanted to give a special thanks to all, all people that have supported me throughout this experience, especially our donor. Um, you heard from 10 of us so far, and all of us have taught, talked to an extent how much of an experience this has been, quite an experience. And as, um, of course, Center for South Asian Studies and Nirma, my host NGO. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you everyone, that was, it was so excellent hearing everyone's presentations. We'll be hosting a reception out um, in the gallery space and you can also eat in the room. Um, I'll guide people if you'd like to sit down. Um, I'd like to leave everyone tonight with, um, did you wanna say something Dave? Okay, so I'd like to leave everyone tonight with that, but thank you so much for coming out. I was sitting here listening to the presentations and I was trying to think, what can I say? And one word popped in my mind, fantastic, uh, really fantastic. And I want to thank each of the fellows for being willing to step out of your comfort zone and participate in a program which I think is very meaningful and I hope and certainly from what you've said uh, it has had tremendous influences on your life. Um, I think in my mind listening to you and seeing what you've done uh, the sky's the limit for you in the future. There is nothing that you're going to face in the real world that will prevent you from accomplishing what you want to do. And I would say, you know, dream high because you can succeed. And thank you so much for doing what you've done. Uh, each year, I think, how do we top this year's uh, group of student fellows? Well, it's gonna be challenging to top what you've done and accomplished. And uh, you know, thank you. Uh, it 
reaffirms my commitment to the program and makes me you know, tremendously glad that uh, I did it. Um, also, I'd once again like to thank the faculty and the staff uh, at the Center of South Asian Studies. Um, your commitment has also made this happen and not only in the last decade, but for future decades. And I'll be back here in 30 years and just, you know, see how things are going. But th this has made me realize the value of this and um, certainly it's my intent that in future years I'll be back for this because this is a highlight of my year. Thank you.